second talk. And uh, he will talk about uh, chemotaxis uh, and reactions in biology. Okay, so Sasha, take it away. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and it's a pleasure to talk here. So uh, let me start by introducing chemotaxis. Uh, probably many of you have, have seen this, um, the, the, the most famous chemotaxis equation. <clears throat> Let's see, yeah. That's a kelly segel equation. <clears throat> and so it's it's equation for, for a density of <clears throat> mold of bacteria. And it, it just diffuses. And uh, then there is this uh, nonlinearity here, which is chemotactic term. The way to think about it is it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a so called parabolic elliptic uh, form because um, the density um, produces chemical. Think of this expression here, Laplacian inverse rho, as, as chemical C. And we make an assumption that chemical diffuses and, and uh, stabilizes at this distribution much faster than any other time scales in the problem. <clears throat> and so then th this is the chemical C. And then this term tells us that density tries to go to higher concentration of, of this chemical. I right? just integrate this use divergence theorem. You get the, uh, surface integral and it's controlled by by derivative of normal derivative of of the chemical <clears throat> and so this uh, really models certain classes of of mold like here i have a picture of, of of their life cycle when they starve or when they decide it's time for them to reproduce they secrete this chemical and then they gather in a very high concentration and form this uh, stalk and spores on top of it, and then spores can fly around and colonize new space. And so there are fascinating uh, analytical properties of this equation, which correspond to describing this. And um, in dimension one, it's, it's globally regular, it's relatively boring. In dimension greater or equal than two, there can be finite time blow up, which people sometimes call chemotactic explosion was first proved by Jarger and Luckhaus. And um, finite mass concentrates, uh, can concentrate at a single point. So that, that kind of corresponds to this stalk growing up, right? It's a transition in the solution. And in fact, in uh, dimension two, it's exactly L1 norm, the mass that is a critical quantity. So small mass solutions are globally regular, large mass solutions are uh, form of singularity and the, there is a critical mass for which you have a transition. <laughs> okay, so, so this equation is, is very well studied, but uh, basically the direction of my talk is that in most situations in biology, chemotaxis actually enters in, in, a, in a different way. So the situations where density is chemotactic on itself are relatively rare. Um, there are quite a bit uh, more processes where one can model these processes with two densities and one is chemotactic on a chemical produced by, by the other. So this includes reproduction processes where eggs secrete pheromones that sperm can sense and swim towards, towards the egg. This includes immune system where uh, injured or infected tissues release chemokines signaling proteins and then uh, immune cells sense that and try to find the infection. It also plays a role in spread of cancer or in organism morphology. So different kinds of cells know where to go using chemical signaling. And so in all these processes, or like in most of these processes, you can think of chemotaxis enabling, aiding something that one can model as a reaction, right? And reproduction, it's fertilization in the immune system. It's like fight between immune cells and invaders. And I actually uh, started thinking about it about 10 years ago when I heard a talk by a oceanographer, Jeff Weiss, on uh, broadcast spawning for corals. And so he talked about uh, the fact that reaction diffusion models greatly underpredict 
the, the, the rates observed in nature. And so they tried to put fluid flow also as the part of the process which solves a little bit closes the gap, but not entirely. And he conjectured that maybe chemotaxis plays a role. And so jointly with Leonia also about 10 years ago, we made the first step in looking at this system here. It's also a single equation system. So it's sort of like assuming that both densities coincide and, and they're, they're chemotactic. Both of them are chemotactic on each other. And, and so this is just Kelly Segel, but we add flow and we add reaction. Okay, and this epsilon here is because most biological reactions are weak. So one can think of epsilon as a small parameter. And of course, Q equal to two is most natural, but we, we look at more general range of Qs. And so what we showed is that at least in some settings, chemotaxis can really have actually dramatic influence because uh, if, there is no chemotaxis and there is an assumption on power Q and D here, which just misses the most interesting case, but I'll say uh, when Q is equal to D equal to two, I'll say about it in, in, in a few minutes, uh, there exists a constant such that the mass of rho is always bounded from below by this constant. So, so the integral of rho can be thought of as the measure of success of, of the process, right? If rho disappears, it means it reacts and we don't track the product. So if all it disappears, that means like total fertilization, for example, for corals. And, and um, so, so if there is no chemotaxis, then, then very little uh, reaction can happen. And in fact, as epsilon goes to zero, this constant mu converges to the initial mass. And so very little happens. And uh, this constant mu is independent of flow. So ability of flow to, to improve things, improve, improve rates is, is limited in this context. But then if chemotaxis is not uh, zero, if, if, if it's present, then in dimension two at least, and, and the result is a little bit simpler when u is zero, we can have also something when u is not zero then actually the mass of rho drops down to critical mass of kelly segel equation over a fixed time scale that is independent of epsilon. So there's a kind of singular limit, right? You take epsilon to zero, you'd think that reaction will go to zero, but it doesn't. And this is of course driven by singularity. So solution tries to blow up. In fact, if power is greater or equal than two, it can't, the equation is globally regular. But it will become so large that, that it will overcome epsilon and burn a fixed part of, of the, the mass of rho, no matter how small epsilon is. Okay, so that was a kind of um, nice contrast. Now, when Q is equal to D is equal to two and, and dimension two is natural here, like if you think about corals because they really, uh, fertilization happens on the surface then uh, the, the mass will go to zero, but extremely slowly. So morally, it's a very similar picture. It goes like one over one plus epsilon log T or something like that, so, so very slow. Now, of course, this is a fairly crude model. And now the next model that we tried to think about is a bit more interesting. So, I mean, you can't really talk to biologists about this model, they will laugh at you. But I mean, this model, you already can, they, they will still laugh, but not as loudly. And, and so, so in this model, we do have two densities and row one is chemotactic on row two. You can think of row two as target. And the setup is like on this picture here. So we have some mass of row two and some mass of row one, they're separated by distance L. And we want to find out how much chemotaxis matters for reaction success in this setup. So in this system, there's no singularity. Rho2 just sits in place, right? And it's not, it's just decaying. And so this, this uh, drift term is, is not doing anything crazy. But uh, so, 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 so the whole picture is, is a bit different. And what we want to do is to actually do 
as precise as we can estimates on, on how chemotaxis helps. And for that, we look at half times, how much time it takes for half of row two in this case, because typically mass of row one is bigger in applications. How much does it take for half of mass of row two to disappear? And I'm using half times a little, a little loosely because in reality, sometimes we watch how long does it take for like a quarter to disappear. Right? Um, sometimes it's, it's a little bit simpler. And so there were some results on related systems uh, before by Speho Suzuki and Chai Kang Lee, but mostly it's, it's a little bit cruder results where you just say, okay, when chemodactic coupling becomes very large, then the success rate also becomes very good. But the question is, can one get a little bit more uh, precise results on, on, on comparison of these times? <clears throat> Okay, so um, it turns out to be, well, not so simple. And I will talk today mainly about two D case. It's a joint work with Fede Nazarov, Leon Rizik, and Yao Yao. And it uh, has been accepted at GEMS. And so let's first, let me first tell about diffusive bounds. So when chemotaxis is absent. Uh, so in this case, that these are rigorous uh, bounds, and there are two regimes where the, the picture is a little bit different. So if initial mass of rho one m zero, the large mass times epsilon, is much bigger than one, we have diffusive time which scales over L squared with a little help of this m zero epsilon, but it's just a log help. Okay, so um, and if it's it's much less than one, which is uh, an unfortunate situation when it's very hard to react, so sort of risky case, then this time can be extremely large. Okay, so um, in most applications, we are in this first kind of regime, at least the ones I, I know of. Um, and for example, for like marine animal broadcast spawning, M0 is something like 10 to the 10, and mass of rho 2 is 10 to the 6, and epsilon is 10 to the minus two. So, so we are in this first regime, it's a pretty large parameter. But so for the risky case, diffusive bound is really uh, quite, can be quite terrible. Mm -hmm. And for chemotaxis, uh, let me state a theorem. So we, we work in the situation where, um, again, M0 times epsilon is large. We also have this chemotactic parameter, which is coupling chemotaxis chi times mass of rho two. And so we need it to be less than M zero epsilon greater than one. That's where we get some interesting effects. And mass of M zero much bigger than, of rho one is much bigger than mass of rho two. Mm -hmm. And so under these assumptions, we prove that for radio rho one and rho two, chemical time is less than equal than L squared over here. Okay, so first of all, this can be a pretty significant improvement over diffusive time, right? Because M0 epsilon is bigger than gamma, but of course log epsilon uh, M0 is not. And like in typical values that we have here, it, it, it's likely not the case. So uh, it's actually very hard to find the strength of chemotactic coupling in biological literature. So, so we're not sure how big this parameter is. Um, but so, so that's what we can prove. And now radial data is of course restrictive and you don't expect it to be radial in applications, but I'll tell later why uh, this is the limitation that we have. Uh, it turns out actually that this is basically a limitation of the model. So the classical form of the Segel equation may not be quite appropriate for for this problem. And there, there are ways to, to fix this that I will talk about later. And so heuristic for this estimate is that it, it should be sharp. If you think about behavior of Laplacian inverse in two dimensions, it's going like a logarithm at infinity, gamma logarithm. And so the, the drift corresponding to that is gamma r minus one. 
and then transport with this kind of drift exactly takes L squared over gamma time. So intuitively, that's what, what you should expect. Like if chemotaxis plays the main role in transporting rho one towards rho two. So I will also mention that in one dimension, uh, there is a work, uh, recent work that is joint with my graduate student, Yi Shugong. And in that case, we don't need radial assumption, right? So in 1D radial just means even, we don't need that. And the improvement in time is, is more dramatic in one dimension. Um, so you, you actually don't have L squared in one dimension. And actually some structures involved, for example, in reproduction, uh, a quasi one dimension, maybe, maybe for a reason. <clears throat> okay, so that's basically the first main result that I want to talk about. And let me now uh, describe how this is proved <clears throat> a little bit. And so the first ingredient that goes into the proof is the mass comparison principle. So to control this nonlinear problem, we will compare it with a linear Fokker Planck equation. Okay, so this is equation of the same form as we have in the system for rho one, but without reaction. And we replace Laplacian inverse of rho two just by H. <clears throat> and this potential H is chosen so that it's sort of the, the weakest attracting potential that, uh, we can have while the mass of rho two is still bigger than, than half of what we had initially. Okay, and so um, this is something that you can compute. What is this weakest potential? It turns out that it corresponds to the situation where we have an annulus. So we, we eat the, the center of the initial data. And, and by the way, I will work with second density, which originally is just characteristic function of a unit form. Yeah, so, and, and we rescale in this, in this uh, we can always rescale space so that the radius is one, so to have one less parameter for simplicity. And it's, it's not hard to generalize, but I mean, this is a prototypical case. In, in, in reality, we'll, we smooth it a little bit, but it's, it's convenient to think about it as just characteristic function. And so then the, the weakest potential corresponds to this uh, uh, annulus where the, the middle is, is eaten out. And this is the picture of this potential H. So it's actually constant on the part where there is no rho two. And then at infinity, it decays like minus gamma log R over four, but you know, constant is not so important. And then mass comparison principle says the following, that for all times before we reach the, the half time, the mass of rho one in any ball is bigger than mass of rho in that ball, minus one half of, of the initial mass of rho. So this part is, is maximum that we can eat. And so that's why we subtracted here that, that real, real um, mass of rho one may lose this part. And the initial data is of course the same we take for this photo Planck equation and, and for the nonlinear system. And so that's, that's what we need from the mass principle. And intuitively it's, it's sort of clear and the proof is not very complicated uh, because attracting potential is always weaker for, uh, for rho, then it, it gets pulled inside any rho BR less than, than the, the nonlinear system. <clears throat> Sasha, you mean ball centered at zero? Yeah. No, no, no. Center that zero. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's first ingredient. So I, I, I will not say more about it. Mm -hmm. And then the second ingredient is that we need to understand this linear problem. Mm -hmm. And if we want to take uh, to, to really to prove results that cor corresponds to the heuristic result we have to have very good tool for analyzing this linear system, this linear equation. So there's a couple of ways to do it. And I will describe one, which gives you more information. And it's about 
convergence to equilibrium for, for this class of focal plan cooperators. So this is of course classical subject with huge literature, the focal plan cooperators and convergence to equilibrium in, in this setup. So this operator is self-adjoint on the weighted space. Yeah, and that's exactly operator that appears in this linear focal plan. And it's non-negative and it has a ground state e to the h, you just compute it explicitly. And so in our case, e to the h will uh, have this form. So our ground state will decay as a power infinity at the rate uh, proportional to gamma, r minus gamma. And now for, uh, <clears throat> and convergence to equilibrium will be exactly convergence to this e to the h. And in particular, it means that the mass of, of rho will go to the, to the middle because of course, e to the h is, is large in the ball where rho two is, right? And it's small outside. So this is what we want. We want to, to show that it gathers in the middle. And then we can also show that for rho one using mass comparison principle. So, um, in fact, it gives us more information than we can use. So it, it's also of dependent interest. Now, results on that go back at least to Brask and Believe for uniformly concave H, so something like minus X squared. <clears throat> and in this case, there is a spectral gap. So converge, <clears throat> converges to equilibrium is exponential. <clears throat> Excuse me. There were also later results which uh, worked for more general weights which can degenerate. And so for like powers of, of R between one and two, and in that case, there is still spectral gap. But for weaker powers of a log, there's no spectral gap. And one, one doesn't expect it. There are some results by Rochner, Wang, and Veritenikov on convergence to equilibrium, but the rates are very suboptimal. In particular, we will need rates that have very precise dependence on gamma if we want to get the heuristic rate in our theorem. And, and they, they sort of don't track it. They didn't have this goal, I suppose. And um, now to, to say a few words about how we, we get this, these sharp rates, it's convenient to talk about dual equations. So this is L2 dual for Planck operator. And whatever you prove for this operator, you can talk into this operator F just by multiplying F by appropriate weight. You can switch to the other focal plank operator. I mean, this is one is a little bit simpler to talk about because in particular L infinity norm of F is conserved for this focal plank. And this one is self-adjoint on, on L2 with a little bit different weight. And the ground state is just one. And so if we just look at the weighted L2 norm for this operator and we differentiate it, the computation shows that it decays, the decay is controlled by this weighted integral of the gradient. And so if we could prove weighted Poincaré inequality, which would say that this thing always bigger than constant times the, the left-hand side, then we will be done. It's, it's then exponential convergence. And, and uh, that's uh, how these things often um, turn out. And that's how they turn out for like uniformly concave weight. But in our case, of course, it can't happen because we don't have spectral gap. We don't expect spectral, spectral gap. And then the corresponding tool, which helps you do something is called weak weighted Poincaré inequalities. And so here's an example of such an equality due to Bokov and Ledoux for the weight, which is just the power weight. So it's called weighted for obvious reason, and it's called weak because your weight for the gradient <clears throat> is a little bit stronger. So you can't show this inequality with the same weight. You have to make it stronger by x squared, and then this inequality falls true. So that's the weak part. The good part is that also there is a nice dependence on gamma. The bigger gamma is, the weaker constant you have in front of the gradient term. Now it turns out that we can't use Bapov Ledoux. If we did, we would get chemical time L squared. Too bad, right? And then it 
doesn't fit heuristics. What we need to do is to prove a sharper weighted Poincaré inequality, which also involves this weight x squared, but it has a better constant, better power for gamma. So it has gamma squared, and this is sharp, and this gives us exactly our uh, uh, um, our separate term for like unit ball because we don't expect any gamma there. We have a flat part, so we cannot beat the, the usual Poincaré inequality over the flat part. So we have to split into different regions. In fact, Bokov and Ledoux, the constant is sharp if you are not willing to split the integral on the right hand side. But I mean, if you split it, then for this weight, you will also get, in, in the far range, you will get uh, gamma minus two factor. <clears throat> So let me say just a little bit about the proof. <clears throat> um, to give you an idea what goes into it, and I, I want to give an idea where this gamma comes from. <clears throat> that's that's important for us. And so, so let me try to explain that a little bit. So this is precise form of, of our weight. At infinity, it's a power weight. It has flat part. It has transition region. So we'll split the weighted L2 norm into three parts according to that, right? So we'll have the inner part. R1 is just this, this flat part. We have transition region. We have far range. How to choose R2 is a little bit arbitrary. Anything between 1 over square root of 2 and 1 would work. But let's say we fix some value of R2. Also replace mean of F by the average over the angle at just fixed uh, point R1. And this dominates the integral when we have the mean, the mean, right? The mean kind of minimizes the whole integral. And it turns out to be a little bit more convenient for the best. And so we also split the, the gradient integral in a similar fashion. Um, and let's see. I think I forgot the x squared here. Okay, so there's an extra weight here. And so um, then this is the theorem that we really prove. So we, we prove kind of separate estimates on each the, the inner part, the transition part, and the far range. And if you sum them up, you get exactly the Poincare inequality that I stated. But this is actually stronger than Poincaré inequality, and we use the fact that it is strong. And this is also true if you decide to cut off at some large radius. So you can put like stop, just stop your integration at R, and similar estimates will hold true for the integrals that are cut off. And so here's where gamma squared comes from. So, so let me uh, look at I3. Right. This is this is this uh, last part, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, where, where we get one over gamma squared. So we first do the proof for radial functions, and and then we we use angular harmonics decomposition to to generalize to arbitrary one. So for radial function, this is I three. This f tilde is now just f because f doesn't depend on angle, just f of R one. And so we will estimate this I3 into two terms, yeah, passing to uh, the difference with R2, right? That's the boundary of the far range. And then the difference between, between the two. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this first term then, the way we estimate it, there are three steps here. So so it's, it may not be immediately visible how, how you get this bound, but you just replace this difference by the integral of the derivative. Then you do Cauchy-Schwarz with including like W one quarter here towards this term. And then you change the order of integration and you get this in the point. And then you just verify that this weight expression that, that you have here and, and W is my shortcut for e to the h, right? 
So in fact, also Jacobian is included here now, there is R times E to the H. And so you can just check that this integral satisfies this bound. And where does gamma uh, come from? It comes from integration of the power, X to the minus gamma, or right? So the power at infinity. Each time you integrate, you get one over gamma. So there are two integrals here, you get twice one over gamma downstairs. So you just do the calculation and, and get this constant. Okay, so this is a sample calculation. There are several different terms you need to estimate. You need to estimate this term. And in, in this term, you will need help from J2, kind, kind, kind of, so, sorry, in this one, right? Because you have F of R2 minus F of R1. That's exactly J2 domain. And that's why J2 also enters in the estimate. Okay, so, but that's, that's the idea behind this inequality. And so once you have it, um, you, uh, you, you can use it to show convergence to, to, the, to the ground state at a certain rate that is weaker than exponential. So, so recall that this is the weighted L2 norm that we are trying to estimate. This is what we're trying to estimate with Y. And the, the derivative of I is exactly this gradient. And so the way to, to get basic, what we need basically, we need to bound now W in terms of I. And to get that, we do cut off at some distance R, which is larger than one. We use consideration of L infinity norm for F. And then we apply the theorem on IR and get estimate by these J's. And finally, here, we can estimate this J by W by paying R squared, right? Because we cut, cut off R, at R. So this extra X squared weight in, in J3 comes on top here. And that's what we get. And here we can optimize R and get this bound of I by W. And putting this into the, 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 this, this differential quality, we can just derive the rate of decay. Okay, so it's it's not not too complicated, and 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 now going back to the original Fokker Planck, uh, it's just different by weight. So as I mentioned, you can negotiate between the F and rho Fokker Planks by multiplying functions by weight. Uh, you get this this kind of rate of decay on the weighted L2 norm, right? So this is what you get for I for the F equation, and this is what you get for, for rho. Now that's not quite enough yet, because if you now put here our scenario from which you started like rho and rho one, rho two, far, far away, um, right? So target in the middle and rho at distance L away and total mass M zero, and, and you look at what, what this bound becomes, then uh, in fact, you get that the convergence happens at times L squared over gamma, right? If you trace exact decay of the weight. And, and so, so this is not good. And the way to get the decay that we want is, uh, is a trick that I first saw in just heat equation with incompressible drift where you can derive L2, L1 to L2 decay by using Nash inequality and it goes like T minus D over four. And then you can dualize this and get L2 to L infinity inequality, which is also goes like minus D, T to the minus D over four. And then you can run each of them for time T over two. And then that gives you the decay T minus D over two for L infinity, for L1 to L infinity. So you, you, you have to do the same thing here. You, you take a dual to this bound and, and then you combine that dual with itself and then you get L infinity, weighted L infinity to L1 inequality, which now scales um, in a fashion that gives you the right time. Okay, so, so basically once we have that, we know by mass comparison that 
significant portion of R1 ended up on support of, of R2 within this time L square over gamma. And then what we, what we do is we prove that reaction happens on passage, right? So while the mass moves through support of R2, it reacts. And here we use this assumption that epsilon M0 is bigger than gamma because gamma is the speed, maximal speed with which it can move. And so while it moves, much of it still needs to react. And that exactly happens if epsilon M0 is bigger. And here also radial assumption enters because if radial assumption is not true, you could imagine that this mass rho one enters the support of some very thin region and then the, the ground state could be very concentrated near zero, right? That's where it would have maximum if in particular no rho two reacted out, if it's just characteristic function of the ball. And it can get there with relatively little reaction happening. And then you lose a significant kind of factor in the estimate if you, if you allow that. And, and maybe you have to then track how it will eat the middle and then relax a little bit because ground state will change. It, it's tricky and it clearly loses some essential uh, estimates, essential factors. And, and this is uh, not natural somehow. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a problem with the model because in reality, of course, drift cannot be arbitrarily large. So gamma can be very large, especially if mass of rho two is large. And nevertheless, rho one has a certain speed limit. Applications, you cannot go as fast as you want. And so um, a way to, to fix this um, is, is to consider what's called flux limited chemotaxis. And there you replace the Keller-Segel drift with drift that has a speed limit. So this function phi here is, is a cutoff function, is just absolute value of x initially, but then it levels out at something like uh, one, okay? And so then the maximal speed is just chi and doesn't depend on mass of rho. <clears throat> and so in this case, we expect that uh, the, the radial assumption is, is not necessary. And uh, in fact, if you know that much of rho one ended up on support of rho two, you know also that it's reasonably spread out because your drift is, is not, not, not large. And, and so in this case, uh, it will just uh, react through and, and not be overly concentrated in some region. <clears throat> and so this is in progress. So this is not done yet, but uh, it's it, uh, likely to go through. And so I think that's the all, all the hard math that I wanted to talk about. So um, if you went to sleep, it's maybe a good time to come back or if you just finished your chess match. Uh, but um, now I, I wanna show some pictures. And uh, first of all, talk about, uh, fun example due to Andres Latish. I, I don't think it's written down, but the idea is, is pretty clear. And it addresses exactly this radial issue that, okay, we should be able to relax radial assumption, but I don't, we can't go to arbitrarily row two fact. <clears throat> so that's an interesting, interesting observation that sometimes chemotaxis can, can hurt the reaction. And so this, this actually example, it makes touch with the well-known donkey dilemma fable, where a donkey cannot choose between two very nice bales of hay. And it's, it's easiest to explain in one dimension. So in one dimension, the drift is determined just by misbalance of, of mass on the left and on the right. And it does not depend on the distance, right? So, so that's, that's a one dimensional feature, but one can build something similar in two dimensions just by, by doing quasi one dimensional structures. And 
And so if you start with very close masses on two sides, then first row one will go to slightly larger mass, but it will very quickly eat the excess mass of row two, which could be very small. And then they will be pulled towards the other pile, which will become slightly larger. And then most of the time, if L is sufficiently large, if epsilon is sufficiently small, most of the time will be spent in transition. And so in this case, it's clear that one, if one wants to make to prove a theorem about the enhancement of reaction by chemotaxis, one needs to make some assumptions, like the, the center of row one, the single center of row one, or maybe some geometric assumptions, which may be uh, more precise. I, I'm not sure what they could be. I mean, single center clearly should work. <clears throat> and so you, you could have single center, but not, not not radial data and, and that for, for, for flux limited chemotaxis that shouldn't be a problem. <clears throat> okay, so then um, the last thing I wanted to mention is something that we worked out recently. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a simplified problem. So one natural direction of what to do next. And there are actually, I think there are very many <clears throat> natural questions <clears throat> to ask about this problem. But one is bringing U back, the, the, the fluid velocity. What we've done felt relatively tricky even without U, but perhaps one can start with a shear. Many of these problems Shear is very natural because length scales involved are small and all flows look like shears when length scale is small enough. And so uh, we played with a problem that is simpler. We don't have really a PE. Uh, we just have a single agent, a single seeker and a single target. So target is like a disc at the center of the torus, we are in a periodic box, and the agent starts in the corner. And then the agent performs random walk and is advected by ambient shear. And there is also chemotaxis. And chemotaxis is produced by the target according to this flux limited rule. And again, it's an elliptic version here for, for the chemical concentration. Um, and chemotaxis is produced, you can think of n target as characteristic function of, of the target. Uh, maybe we smooth it a little bit for, for analysis, but, but that's, that's basically the problem. And we want to estimate expected time that it takes the agent to hit the target. Uh, of course, there is PD for this expected time. I don't want to, to write it. There are certain things we can prove for this problem. For example, with can prove Fraden Wenzel type result for large A. So when A is very large, it results essentially in dimensional reduction. So everything depends only on your random walk uh, along Y axis because you are traveling so fast around, around the X axis. And so one can, one can prove convergence uh, with this a, large A limit to some effective problem, which also includes chemotaxis. It's, it's not very surprising. So, so what I, I like best, it's, it's, it's my first ever numerical work. And, and I, of course, I didn't do the numerics, but it's first ever kind of numerical paper that I'm on. And um, I found one numerical observation we made very interesting. So this is expected hard at, hard target heating time. And here's a picture of what happens when there is no chemotaxis. So uh, this is uh, three different box sizes, and this is shear rate. Okay, so basically it's like A over L, where L is the size of the box, and A is the amplitude of the shear. And just as I told you, when A becomes large, it's a dimensional reduction. These lines here are one dimensional heating times for which one can one has analytic form, right? So it's it's uh, it's explicit form. 
and it's monotone and it, it tends to the limit that you expect. So that's like pure dimensional reduction. Now here is one of these graphs, the, 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 the y-axis is scaled a little bit differently, but it's, it's the same graph. And uh, this is the case without chemotaxis. And this is the case with chemotaxis with very actually weak chemotactic coupling. And so what, what happens here is that the, the target heating rate is no longer monotone the minimal rate is achieved at very fairly low shear rates. So it's like 10 minus one shear rate. And then of course, for large A, you converge to one D time. It's a slightly different one D time because there is chemotaxis, but actually like for our parameters, it's not, we don't see even numerically, we don't see difference between pure diffusion and, and chemotaxis limiting problems. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we have this, this optimal shear for which the target heating rate is better than the large A limit. And I'm showing just one graph, but it also looks similarly if we change a little bit shear, like chemotactic coupling, or if we change the box size, there are similar graphs. For larger boxes, it becomes slightly less pronounced, but still the shape is, is, is very similar. And so what uh, amazed me is that this shape in this numerical simulation, it really looks similar to the graph uh, that comes out of biological experiments. So there are, there are wonderful experiments by Riffle and Zimmer on Reda Ballone spawning they performed it in the lab and they did exactly this kind of analysis so they produced the shear in taylor coet cylinders and then they looked at fertilization uh, failure rate uh, for different shears for for the red balloon actual uh, spawning process and it's a very similar graph of failure rate except it goes like up to one in the case for large shears. And there is a mechanism there which they think is responsible for it. They say that for large shear, it's very hard for sperm to stay near the egg. So they just get teared, teared apart. They, they need some time to stay around, to succeed. And for us, there's no such mechanism. We don't have this in our model. So we just have basic diffusion, we have basic shear, we have basic chemotaxis. And these three main elementary forces produce this optimal shear by themselves. So it's a kind of basic property of the interaction of these three uh, components. And I, I honestly didn't expect it. And, and I thought it's gonna still be monotone. And um, we don't have a good explanation for this observation. So, so we don't have a theory even a heuristic one over why that is the case. Um, we did try running it for the deterministic system without diffusion, and we see a similar dip. So it's somehow it's it's an interaction of chemotaxis and shear that, that produces it. <clears throat> so I think it's very interesting, very interesting to to find out why why this happens, really have have a good explanation for it. <clears throat> And so let, let me now just uh, state some, some future directions that I find natural in this whole area. So I think this question has been understudied because it's really appears much more commonly in, in biology, uh, this setup with two densities and, and chemotaxis of one density on the other. So it's something that, you know, if you do it, you can talk to biologists and get feedback and more nice questions. But uh, the natural things are, one could add a diffusion to row two equation, right? We didn't do it for, for now. We just look at the stationary one. For flux limited chemotaxis, you can do risky regime as well. And in, in that regime, the enhancement can be expected to be quite dramatic, uh, right? You, you would kill this exponent essentially, which, which, uh, which is a lot. 
adding fluid flow may be challenging, but you know, at least in some simpler models, it suggests something that there could be something quite interesting. And you know, 3D equation, 3D case, it's actually uh, focke planck would not work because there is no ground state. The Green's function for 3D case, uh, you know, there is no growth at infinity or, or decay at infinity. But one can still use uh, probabilistic bounds of barrier arguments to do something in 3D case. Okay, so I'll, I think that I'll stop here and thank you. Hey, thank you, Sasha. Um, anyone uh, has questions? If you have, go ahead. Well, let me say a few things. First, a comment that actually I, I also, this last thing you said about biologists, I, I spoke to some people at UCSD who do actual experiments. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, they 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 mainly care about the scenarios like this. Um, well, at least these people, and not so much the scenarios that have been um, uh, sort of studied in the mathematical literature much more uh, in the last you know 20, 30 years, um, which is the the sort of one D Keller Siegel sorry not one D uh, one equation Keller Siegel. Uh, system that, that you described at the beginning. Anyway, but I have also a couple of questions. So um, uh, the first one uh, was about this uh, thing you mentioned that you are looking, so the time you are studying is the time um, it takes to consume half or maybe quarter or whatever of the, of the row two, right? Yeah. So if you wanted to consume, let's say 90% of it, Right, so there is a natural way to do it, which is um, just uh, you know consume quarter and then consume quarter of whatever is left, etc. Right? Is this how you have to get those uh, estimates if you needed to get those estimates, and would it give you the same estimates, just differ different by constant, or would it get you something worse, or can you do something better? Yeah, I mean, I think you would have to work a little bit because the way we prove it right now, we prove it on the passage, and then that there is just single passage. Mm -hmm. Right, you don't get another chance. So, so uh, one would need some additional estimate, or maybe one would need to. Um, right, I mean, if you want to eat more, you kind of forced to use a different attracting potential, right? I mean, you have to to say, okay, I mean, I, I will now have even weaker attracting potential, mm -hmm. and yeah, you could do that. So, I think it's uh, it's just a matter just a little bit difficult to write mm -hmm. okay. I, I don't look forward to writing <laughs> so i, I understand so, <laughs> that, so, we did, so we didn't fight hard for it but sometimes we even gave up one half just because it was more convenient for us uh, coming out of of the technical estimates mm -hmm. but yeah i i don't think uh, there is a I, I think the qualitative relationship will remain the same Okay, um, <clears throat> I have uh, one more question um, about the last thing you said. Uh, uh -huh. So these 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 uh, numerical simulations. Uh, can you tell me? So you uh, maybe go the slide back. Uh, so you yes. So so where is your target located and where is your starting point? Yeah, sorry, I didn't have the, the picture ready for that. Oh, that's okay. Uh, Just yeah. roughly. So 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 the target is the. So yeah, it's it's the target is a disk in the middle. See, okay. L is uh -huh. the size here. L is eighty. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then the target is a disk of of size delta that is located in the middle. Uh -huh. Delta is small generally, and uh, we can scale it to be one, right? Uh -huh. And and the agent starts in the corner. Uh huh. Does it always start in the corner? In our simulation, yeah, we took it starting in. the we, 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 we try to take it somewhere else qualitatively, the results look similar. Well, so, so, you know, because I'm thinking about this explanation, if you go to the next slide, about this dib you talk about, right? So there is a natural, but, you know, very simple explanation, um, uh, which is that, well, if you make your shear flow such that 
during the time it takes for the agent to seek out the target, the shear flow just moves the agent from the corner to the middle of the square, uh -huh. right? So, uh -huh. so then of course it improves the time because the, the agent doesn't need to go diagonally. It just basically, the flow helps him in the horizontal direction. And so the agent sort of just needs to add some vertical velocity. Right, so 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 that would be a natural thing. So right, so so the question would be if you start your agent not in the corner but at a randomly chosen position uh -huh. uh, at the bottom, and then but make your flow independent of the randomness, right? So make your flow speed constant and then start at a random position. Ask mm -hmm. whether you still see the dip, and if you still see the dip, then I would say that well, that sounds like an interaction of the shear flow and the chemotaxis. But if you, uh, if you don't see the dip anymore, then that would say, well, that was just a specific uh, speed that brings you from the corner to the middle of the domain during the time the agent takes to seek out the target. So- uh, no, I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand. What do you mean during the time? It, 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 well, uh, so, so imagine that you are, I mean, if you go back to the slide before, right? So if you go, yeah. if, 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 you, if you start in the corner, yeah. And you want to go in the center without any flow. So you need to move diagonally, right? So you used chemotaxis and diffusion takes you some time, right? But if now during the time you move diagonally, your flow is also flowing you to the right, then mm -hmm. it helps you to speed up. And if the flow is not too fast, you won't overshoot because of the flow. You will just sort of just, you know, while you are moving up, the flow is helping you, right? So... So, 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 so that's a, that's a sort of a natural thing. But of course, if you have the same flow and you start in the middle of the domain, the middle of the bottom, then mm -hmm. while you are moving towards the target, the flow is taking you away from the target very slowly. And so it slows down things. So you would therefore expect if, you know, if, if this idea is correct, you would somehow expect that, that if you start in the middle of the domain, the same flow actually makes things possibly worse for you. And maybe some other slightly larger flow will make it big, better or not, I don't know. And of, uh, you know, so, 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 so that's why I'm saying randomize the bottom and see whether you still see for the same strength of the flow, you still see this improvement or you don't see it anymore. Right? Yeah, and that's so an interesting question. You are right. I mean, it's not hard to look at it. So, so yeah, I mean, exactly. You have the code, so you can do it tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe not tomorrow because we, like this, this is based like on thousand trials for each. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so it, it, it works like overnight. <laughs> okay, well, but you know, you have a student, so. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, I, I run it on my computer because I have the fastest computer. Oh, home. really? Okay. I, it's, it's an 18 <laughs> processor, and and so so it, it's possible to do it on laptop. Yeah. Yeah. I, anyway, so you can you can try. see it even on fewer trials. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. not sure. I I don't think there is like a clear. Um, yeah, I mean, I would be surprised if that was the explanation because essentially here you are outperforming the 1D limit, right? Um, yeah, so, but so, 1D so, limit, yeah, yeah okay. I mean, how, how can you outperform your 1D limit with, 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 with you your... Can, you, you, you can because you see the, the chemotactic potential is the best if you are in the center in the you know the, the vertical line that goes to the center of the square and if you are the one the limit then you are on average you know everywhere so mm -hmm. you sort of average out the chemotactic potential across the square whereas here you sort of spend most of the time near the center so you you, but you, you don't you spend want. most of the time near the center yeah shear keeps carrying you and, no, and chemotactic, like at, 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 at distance l uh, chemotactic potential is uh, very weak. Yeah, but I know, but but still, the, if the shear is exactly made so that while you are moving up, the shear is just moving you from one corner to the center, then yeah. the shear actually can improve it. I'm not saying you know yeah. it's clear to me. I'm just saying this is a potential idea, and you you know if you run your simulation, you'll see whether that 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 is the case or not. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but it's an I agree. It's an interesting thing. So I'm looking, you know, the expected time here is 2000 and the shear rate is one tenth. So it's 200. So mm -hmm. you travel more than once around. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, okay, then maybe you that the time you have to hit because the box size is 80 for this. Okay, I just saw 10 to minus something. I thought that looks like a weak shear. <laughs> but 10 okay. to the minus one. The, the optimal one is 10 to the minus one. For this uh -huh. so, so I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, but yeah. you know, maybe kinematically you kind of resist the shear, but I don't think so. I think it's, it's mm -hmm. weak to resist the shear. By the way, is this shear actually moving around the chemotactic, um, uh, you know, yeah, the cloud, you know, attracted yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's much more elongated yeah. rather than than, okay. than yeah, going vertically. Yeah. Okay. Well, then then maybe. I okay. think most likely it has to do uh, with interaction between this cloud, mm -hmm. which is localized. It's not yeah. mm -hmm. the cloud. The chemotactic cloud does not reach very far vertically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, it's more like effective increase in the size of the target, which for mm -hmm. some reason works better mm -hmm. for, the, the, for the for the weak shears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, it's great if we can find an explanation. I, I think it's it's nice. It's my also first experience submitting a paper to biological journal, and it's very exciting one. You get like three reports which ask you to make like gazillion changes <laughs> and improvements <laughs> and all that, but they didn't ask your question. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think this happens. The, the less exact science, or even if, if you go to humanities, I think it's even worse. Then it's like everybody has their own uh, ideas of what a paper should talk about. <laughs> so you get much more of that. <laughs> okay, um, sorry, I just took a lot of time. Any any other questions? Oh, okay, so if not, um, 